Hello everyone, I'm going to be doing a book review today, I'm going to be talking about Shock Value by Jason Zinneman. Uh, the subtitle of the book is How a Few Eccentric Outsiders Gave Us Nightmares, Conquered Hollywood, and Invented Modern Horror. So, it's a nonfiction book. It's primarily a group portrait in some ways of the horror directors, iconic horror directors who started out in the late 60s, early 70s, and would make the movies that would set the template for, for the modern genre, at least for American cinema. And so we, there's chapters covering, like some of the recurring characters in this book are people like John Carpenter, Dan O'Bannon, George Romero, Ryan De Palma, Wes Craven, and a few a few others that I'll probably get to later. So the book is sort of modeled on easy writing, easy writers, raging bulls, that um, history of, of the new Hollywood directors. And this book is covering the same territory in some ways, but it's primarily focused on um, on horror, the horror genre. So by the mid late 1960s, that's really the dividing line for classic horror and modern horror. And really before that, the horror genre in movies was looked down upon. It was considered something that no serious person would ever give much attention to. It was maybe not considered outside of mainstream society, but it was just considered kind of like a, a trashier type of film low budget movies acting not so great you know just kind of dopey type of movies and that was kind of the perception of the genre by the middle of the 60s and although there were great horror fans and there was a very vibrant community of people who took these movies seriously and 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 um, wrote about them and, and, and made an argument that these movies were just as important as some of the other more um, well-regarded classics. So, so like the early horror genre, I mean, the book doesn't get into like German expressionism like in the 20s, but, but we kind of go over like the universal monsters of the 30s and 40s, movies like Dracula and Wolfman and Frankenstein, all those iconic monster movies that I guess at the time they came out in the 30s were maybe frightening to some audiences, but certainly 20, 30 years later, those movies were not frightening at all. I mean, they were really considered well, more like kids' entertainment or, than anything else. But And as the horror genre developed, and, the, and there were lots of different types of horror movies, I mean, Roger Corman is a, is a big figure who maybe deserves a little bit more attention in this book, although he, he does come up and who directed a lot of low budget horror movies in, in the, um, 50s, 60s, 70s. And, but later you know, his Edgar Allan Poe movies, cycle of Poe movies he made in the early sixties were almost art cinema, very much influenced by European filmmakers like, like Bergman. So, and, you know, Vincent Price starred in all those. If there was a iconic actor in the horror genre in the 1960s, it would be Vincent Price, who, who a big fan of Vincent Price. But, you know, his acting, he always kind of rode that line between camp and, you know, seriousness. Like there was always like a tongue in cheek to, to Vincent Price. And that was part of the fun of, of watching um, all those movies he did with Roger Corman and William Castle, who who does figure into into shock value. So so the genre by the mid late sixties would really start to transition into more modern horror. And and if there's one movie that best encapsulates that transition, I would have to say it would be Target's Peter Bogdanovich movie that he made for Roger Corman. And Targets, not to get too much into the plot, but it, it stars Boris Karloff is in the movie. And it's it's a meta movie in a lot of ways. And it also deals with gun violence 
play it's, it has a very prescient story about gun violence in targets and the main theme of the film which i think karloff basically even says i'm paraphrasing in that movie is that how the real world by the late 60s was way more terrifying than any what any horror movie had ever put on the screen i mean this is the time of, of time of political unrest, a time of the Vietnam War is raging, and people are reading newspapers and watching TV and and just getting horrific accounts of what was happening in, in, in Vietnam at the time, and and just the culture by the late sixties was really entering into a tumultuous phase, and and Targets is about that. It's about the transition from the more theatrical horror of the classic years to the more realistic horror that the modern horror movies w would be. So, so I, I mentioned William Castle and he's another key figure and, and Castle was a great promoter of horror movies. You know, he made um, like the Tingler one he made with Vincent Price and Castle was famous for his gimmicks, whether it was 3d movies or, putting buzzers in the seats or doing all doing all sorts of um, outrageous things to, to get people into the theaters to watch his movies. And if you've ever seen the movie um, Matinee with John Goodman, um, the Joe Dante movie, which Goodman plays a, a film director really based on like a William Castle. But by the late 60s, William Castle had read a novel called Rosemary's Baby and bought the rights to the novel. And the, the novel by Ira Levin was about um, a young woman in New York City, Rosemary, and she's um, a young wife. Her husband's an, an aspiring actor, and they're, the, they're kind of this young, hip couple in, in New York, and they become the target of... Um, Satanists who live in their apartment building, and it becomes um, a, ver a very nefarious story about about um, many things. And William Castle had the rights to the novel, and he wanted to direct it, but ended up he was kind of pushed out of that and into a producer role. And Roman Polanski was brought in to direct Rosemary's Baby, which another um, iconic movie of the time. You know, Polanski was a European director. He directed um, thrillers in Europe, and he was highly regarded, and he was um, came to Hollywood to make movies and made Rosemary's Baby and, and brought a sense of realism to it. Uh, it. Definitely a Hitchcock influence, but also just this... There was nothing theatrical about Rosemary's Baby, even though the story itself was was fairly outrageous it, it it made people believe that it was real and something like that could happen in in a modern type of environment so so castle produced it and and he was and, and probably for the good i think polanski's rosemary's baby what you know i mean it's it's one of the all-time greats of the horror genre so so that was a big movie. The book spends time on. Sixty-eight was a big year. Um, I, I think I mentioned Targets and Night of the Living Dead from George Romero comes out. Romero, a filmmaker based in Pittsburgh, and had directed a lot of commercials and local TV things like that, and got together a troupe of actors and made a zombie movie that on a very low budget, and it became um, a massive a big success anyway for Romero and, and it's a movie that also spoke to its time. It, it was, it had more gore than traditional horror movies. It was subversive in a lot of ways and way it was kind of a, an allegory of, of the breakdown of, of um, American society at the time. So I know Romero later kind of denied that he had um, much, social commentary he wanted to put in the film but but nevertheless it was in the air and, and at least unconsciously it, it that made its way into night of living dead and and a lot of people will attest like like roger ebert wrote a famous review where he talked about i think being in a theater with young people and they were terrified and stephen king also has written about night of living dead as as a real big moment i think when he was in college and, and seeing that film so there's Night of Living Dead. And as the decade evolves, as we move into the 70s, 
it seemed like every year there were horror movies that were really um, having a, an impact on, on culture. And I mentioned John Carpenter comes up in, in this and Carpenter's an interesting character. Um, I don't know if he comes off too well in this book. I mean, Carpenter was his parents or I believe his father was an academic Carpenter grew up in Kentucky and, but grew up in a very, um, kind of a cultured household, you might say, and went to film school at USC. He came after kind of like the George Lucas years, but Carpenter came in right after that. And and his student films at USC, one of them won an Oscar. It was a short Western that he made. And then uh, as a graduate student, I think, he made Dark Star with um, Dan O'Bannon, who also, that's kind of the, one of the central relationships in the book, O'Bannon and Carpenter and how Carpenter directed Dark Star and O'Bannon wrote the movie and acted in the movie and did a lot of other stuff as well. And 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 that's not a horror movie. It's a, it's a science fiction movie, but, but it's a, one of those, if you watch Dark Star today, it's going to look really very much of the 1970s, but at the same time, there's a lot of themes and ideas in the movie that future movies would would latch on to but but that relationship between Carpenter and O'Bannon is interesting and in how after Dark Star Carpenter his career was certainly on the rise like he he was selling his scripts and he made another Assault on Precinct 13 not a horror movie but a really good kind of police thriller and then there was of course, Halloween would come after that in, in, in 78 in Carpenter. And that kind of um, made Carpenter like his status as a horror master of horror. And in O'Bannon, his career was a bit rockier. Like he, he was involved with the Dune project that uh, Hodorowski was trying to get off the ground in the 70s. Of course, that was never made. And, and O'Bannon was off to, he wrote um, the initial script for Alien, what became Alien. And and of course, O'Bannon um, got into some disputes with producers, and the final product wasn't necessarily what he wanted. But but um, he was there, and it's kind of sad. Like Carpenter and O'Bannon were friends for a time, but it sounds like the two um, a lot of jealousy and a lot of um, differences they had kind of blew up their friendship to the point where by the end of the seventies, they're kind of trashing each other's movies. Um, like Carpenter famously said alien. He did, wasn't a fan of alien. And then O'Bannon turned around and said, Carpenter's the thing wasn't that good either. So, so that's the book gets into some of those interpersonal conflicts. Um, Wes Craven, another figure in the book, maybe the most interesting one of this group, you know, gets a lot into Craven's background. You know, Craven grew up in a very um, strict religious family. <laughs> His childhood, you know, he wasn't allowed to watch movies or, you know, a lot TV, a lot of restrictions. And later he went to college, like a very conservative college. And same thing, a lot of um, repression. And eventually Craven broke out of that. You know, he decided... Finally, he decided he, 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 he went through this period where he embraced freedom and put all of the religious baggage aside that had been just thrown at him so much. And he, he kind of became a bohemian and traveled around and um, got married and, and got into filmmaking. You know, that's really what he wanted to get into. But, but he was also a literary professor. He was also a professor of literature for a time. So Craven was kind of an interesting renaissance man. And his big breakout film was The Last House on the Left, which is a, another, the film's over 50 years old, but remains a, a, a very um, potent movie about, about violence and revenge and, and things like that. And, and I feel like Craven deserves a little bit more attention these days. It seems like Carpenter is, you know, Carpenter's still around, you know, and, and Craven, of course, passed away several years ago, but, but Craven's movies really hold up well. I mean, his, he made three movies that really were decade defining. You know, I mentioned last house on the left 84 would be nightmare on Elm street, which start, launched the Freddy Krueger franchise. And, and that movie is by far the best of that 
Shadow series. And then in 95, 96, mid 90s, he directed Scream, which was another real zeitgeist type of movie. So, but Craven's other stuff is really good too and worth checking out. I'm like, I recently watched like Serpent and Rainbow and, and Shocker and, and um, The People Under the Stairs, these kind of late 80s early 90s movies that that Craven made so so um, a lot of these people in the book had ups and downs and the book gets into that and now it's interesting Zimmerman does talk about filmmakers like Brian De Palma who made thrillers and 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 you know, he like Carrie and, and sisters were two of them in the Fury De Palma's one and yeah, he was a director who was able to break out. You know, De Palma never kind of got branded as a horror director, whereas someone like George Romero, even though he made some really good movies outside the zombie genre, like like Martin and um, um, oh, a movie about the the knights. Um, Idols escaping me now, but but um, yeah, he he made some interesting movies, but kind of towards the latter stages of his um, career, Romero was kind of trapped in that box of he could only make zombie movies, which is unfortunate. And Carpenter as well, you know, tried to break out. You know, he he became mainly known for his horror movies, but but his attempts to kind of break outside of horror movies like. Night Riders was the movie I was trying to think of with Romero, which is a really good movie from the early '80s. But um, anyway, back to um, Carpenter. Carpenter Memoirs of the Invisible Man, which he made in the early '90s with Chevy Chase, which was kind of like this mainstream comedy thriller that didn't quite work. And and by the end of the '90s, Carpenter was kind of done with with making movies. So so. That it, it it is interesting to follow the trajectory of um, the careers of of some of the people in this book, but um, yeah, it's a really um, if you're interested, especially in the history of horror, especially in the '70s and '80s, this book is really informative. It's a really it's a really good read. It's not too gossipy like some books of this kind can be, but you do get some of like inside information about the relationships among these directors and i didn't mean, well you know william freakin who just passed away also figures into this book there's a chapter on um on the exorcist and the making of, of that movie which became an, another just iconic horror movie of, of, of the 70s and and um and freakin was another one who was never you know he was able to break out of that like he had made several movies before the exorcist of different genres and and you know he he never got that tag as a horror director and um and toby hooper another figure in this book who made the texas chainsaw massacre in 1974 hooper interesting case kind of moved in and out of mainstream success and you know famously hooper directed poltergeist and there was the whole controversy with who directed poltergeist spielberg or hooper and and the book sheds a little bit of insight on that controversy, which is um, at least Hooper's side of that story, which it seems like we can never get enough lore about the making of, of Poltergeist. Um, but yeah, overall, um, like I said, if you're interested in horror movies of this area, 70s and 80s, it's you'll, it's a good read. And I think we can, if you watch modern horror movies, you can easily still see how influential these directors were. I mean, this was all men, you know, mainly all white men, and there's a lot more diversity in, in horror movies today, which is a good thing. On the other hand, they did, these these filmmakers really did set the template for for um, modern horror, and um, and I think there's, and, and they, there's a lot of respect thrown towards their way, like, Craven and, and Carpenter, um, I think younger people do do like them, and and the fact that these directors they weren't just trying to shock and make exploitation movies, like they were actually saying something in their horror movies. You know, despite all the violence and and all the gore and all that, like there was a real sense of 
making some social commentary with the horror genre, which maybe it was subtle. Maybe it wasn't so subtle. But nevertheless, I think that's a big part of their legacy, too, that, that they left with the genre. So, like I said, very accessible book. Highly recommend it. And I will um, I'll talk to you later. Thanks for watching.